everyone. My name is Kelsey. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. This webinar is presented by brightbod.com. Um, I'm not a doctor. I'm just presenting on my experience. Uh, if you have any questions, please make a video recording of yourself. You can do this by logging on to brightbod.com and clicking on the support groups link and then searching for autism. Um, you can record your question there and then I or someone else at BrightBod will respond back to you in a video recording. We're going to mute all the microphones. Um, they'll be unmuted at the end for additional questions. I strongly encourage everyone to ask questions, so think of them along the way. Um, so tonight I'm going to tell you a good deal about PICA, um, specifically how it presents itself in individuals with autism. Um, I created this presentation kind of like a guide for caregivers who um, take care of someone with PICA, but if you're not a caregiver, if you're just interested, there's a lot of valuable information about the disorder just in general. So first, what is PICA? PICA is an eating disorder that involves eating items that are not food, um, are not typically thought of as food, and that do not contain significant nutritional value. Um, PICA is most common in individuals with developmental disabilities, so among mentally and developmentally um, disabled people, especially ages 10 to 20, um, it's the most common eating disorder. And it's also present in 20% of children who are treated by mental health clinics. Um, compared to other um, severe problems that go along with developmental disorders, PICA is fairly under-researched. What we do know, um, it comes from the DSM-5, which is published by the American Psychiatric Association. They created a criteria of four symptoms for PICA. So the first one is persistence of eating non-food items or items that don't contain nutritional value must last a minimum of one month. The second is the eating of such items must be developmentally inappropriate, which means, um, for example, a child under two, if they mouth objects, inedible objects, um, this is just a normal part of development, so that would not be classified as PICA. The third one is the ingestion of such objects is not part of a culturally supported or socially um, normative practice. And then lastly, if the eating behavior occurs um, in context of another mental disorder or medical condition, it's sufficiently severe to warrant additional um, clinical attention. Um, some examples of inedible objects. There's several different examples because PICA differs for every individual that has it, but um, some very common ones are dirt, clay, um, paint chips, chalk, laundry starch, baking soda, coffee grounds, um, cigarette ashes or butts, hair, paper, sand, and rubber gloves. Um, so PICA can cause an array of health problems, which include intestinal obstruction, intestinal perforation, which is um, a hole in your intestinal lining, um, choking, infections, excessive caloric intake or nutritional deficiency, um, dental problems, toxic effects such as lead poisoning, and in the most extreme cases, it can even lead to death. Um, ingesting non-food items can lead to the need for surgery in many cases, especially if um, the object that's ingested cannot be um, digested or a move along the intestinal tract. So for example, for rubber gloves, they will get matted and hardened within your intestinal tract, which leads to the need for surgery. Um, but it also leads to a very difficult surgery, which um, it's extremely difficult to complete successfully. So that's another uh, negative health effect of the disorder in general. And then moving along to the presentation of pizza in individuals with autism. So there's four fairly common issues that often contribute to PICA in individuals with autism, which the first one is sensory feedback. 
So someone with autism may enjoy the sensory feeling that they get when they put a non-food object in their mouth or um, they eat the object. Uh, the next one is confusing non-food with food items. So some children may believe they're eating food or they may mistake non-food items for regular food and not even realize that they're doing this on purpose. Um, the third one is a craving for nutrients such as zinc or iron, which is can be reflective of a nutritional deficiency. And then the last one is relieving anxiety or stress. So Ingesting non-food items may be a comfort to someone with autism. Um, it may help to reduce anxious feelings. If you believe your child or someone you care for has PICA, you should look for some certain signs. Um, you may notice them often putting small objects such as small toys into their mouth um, or constantly looking around the house for a non-food item, um, usually specific items that they go for. And also, you can check in your child's stool for um, small inedible objects such as pebbles or any of the other um, examples I gave previously. If you do notice these behaviors, um, contacting the individual's primary care or primary pediatrician is really important to figure out why this is occurring and then to move forward and think about treatment options. So before I mention some specific treatments, um, previous research has shown some important preventive strategies that can be kind of effective. Um, research conducted in 2012 suggests the most important factor of preventing PICA is having clinic programs and residential facilities do PICA screenings, which um, include a variety of different steps, which um, could be from uh, prevalence surveys to direct observations to stool checking um, to reviewing uh, medical history or records and from direct interviews with caregivers of an individual who has PICA. And then um, additionally you can consider a PICA safe environment which involves um, well it could be at a there are many in patient um, hospitals or you can create one in a classroom or a house setting um, with the help of a trained professional in PICA prevention. So the professional would complete on-site monitoring to ensure there's no unsafe objects in the area where the individual with PICA um, primarily resides. And this would um, decrease the instance of any PICA-related behaviors. So, for professional treatments, the first step is developing a treatment plan that works best for a specific individual because there's not one treatment that works all across the board for individuals with PICA. Um, you may have to try various different types of treatment before you find one that works, which can be frustrating, but it's very likely. Um, research on treatments of PICA is somewhat limited because many of much of the research is conducted through case studies, which involve just using a few individuals um, with PICA, so you can't really generalize the results to the entire PICA population. The most effective way to decrease PICA behaviors is through a variety of behavioral intervention strategies. Um, these strategies rely mainly on learning principles, such as positive reinforcement or punishment. For life-threatening PICA cases, um, the goal of treatment should be to get the individual to a, a zero level, which means that treatment is not successful until there are um, no instances of PICA behavior for a certain amount of time, depending on the individual. But the most effective behavioral therapy as of yet is Applied Behavioral Analysis, or ABA. This can be used to treat PICA by identifying what works best for an individual. Um, there's three main ways ABA can be used to treat PICA, which are blocking, redirecting, and rewarding. So blocking just entails shadowing um, the individual for a certain amount of time and physically blocking them from the inedible object. Redirecting is if the child is tempted by inedible objects, you just redirect them to a preferred activity, something that they like to do to kind of distract them. 
And then rewarding is just simply rewarding the child for disposing inedible objects with a treat. Um, so specifically for blocking, research has shown that a sweeping motion is most effective. So if you move the child's hand down and away from their mouth whenever they exhibit PICA um, behavior, that's much more effective than taking your own hand and blocking their mouth from, um, blocking their hand from in entering their own mouth. And it's also been shown um, in the use of physical restraint, very brief restraint is much more effective than long duration of restraint. So this would involve physically restraining the individual for a very brief amount of time whenever they exhibit a peak of behavior. In terms of medication, there are medications available, but therapy is definitely the best option. Medication is only available when it's associated with an intellectual disorder. And the medications that are used um, usually contain anti-anxiety or anti-compulsive um, behavior properties. Um, so there's not just one specific medicine that can be used to treat PICA. Uh, in terms of where to look for help, if you do think your child or someone you know has PICA, the first step is definitely going to your pediatrician or your child's pediatrician or their um, doctor because the doctor can determine if the peak of behavior results from a nutritional deficiency or if it's coming from a different factor. So then they would be able to refer you to a professional who um, focuses on peak of disorder. And then you can go from there with treatment options. Also, um, alerting any friends or family that specifically might watch your child is really important because then they can help make sure that any items that your child usually eat, non-edible items that your child usually eats are out of sight or they can help um, deflect any instances where your child might try to ingest such items. So lastly, I just wanted to give some general tips for parents or any caregivers um, the first step after visiting your child's pediatrician would be to recruit a certified behavioral analyst or a CBB, C, BCBA, sorry, who is a trained professional and will be able to assist your child effectively in terms of treatment. You can also try to PICA proof your home, which just involves putting away any inedible objects that your child usually eats. Um, this will decrease their urge or decrease the likeliness that they'll ingest any inedible objects. You can also try to occupy and enrich your child's environment in other ways. So specifically for children who are looking for sensory stimulation, it's important to provide other activities that do not involve his or her pika attraction. This is very um, individualistic. So it just depends on what the child or individual likes. If, for example, if they like doing arts and crafts, you can look online and find different arts and crafts. Basically, this is just to distract the child from um, ingesting any inedible objects. You can also teach your child to differentiate between food and non-food. You can even make this into a fun game. So, for example, you can either use real objects or pictures of objects. Um, you can use a picture of an apple, and if they identify that as food, you can reward them with a small treat, maybe an M&M or something like that. And then you can show a picture of string, for example, and if they identify that as non-food, you similarly reward them for that and kind of make it fun for them so they don't think it's a chore or anything like that. And then lastly, you can replace non-food items with food of a similar texture. So if your child often or enjoys ingesting chalk, you can give them a small amount of confectionery sugar. This has a very similar texture. Um, similarly, if they enjoy eating sand or dirt, you can crush up Oreos or graham crackers really finely to give a similar texture to the dirt and sand. Um, or for clay, you can make edible Play-Doh, believe it or not, just by using some household items, including food coloring, um, flour, and vegetable oil. There's really easy recipes for this online. And so unfortunately, because there is limited previous research concerning PICA, there's very little known about the frequency um, of PICA by culture, race, sex, age, or any other demographic factor. 
So more research is certainly needed on this topic, but to gain a more comprehensive understanding of it. But I'm hopeful that in the future, the near future, um, this research will be completed. So I'm done with the presentation. Um, I'm gonna open up the floor to any questions. Please don't be shy, ask as many questions as you want. I'll do my best to answer them. Um, Kelsey, when you first started, you talked about people eating dirt and chalk and su such like. Yes. I was, I was I'm, I'm not autistic, but I can remember when I was pregnant with my first child, I ate raw starch. That is very common. I've read in the research for women who are pregnant, it is more common to experience um, PICA behaviors. And it usually just lasts during the duration of pregnancy. I'm not sure if that was the case for you. Um, yes, it was. Yeah. The research is pretty limited on this. They're not, I mean, since with pregnancy, cravings are just a normal factor. I think that has a little bit to do with it. But, um, yeah, it's very common for women who are pregnant. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so, is it fair to say that PICA is an eating disorder, and while it does affect uh, autistic people, it can affect really anybody? Oh, yes, definitely. This presentation was just kind of specific to um, combining PICA and autism, but PICA ranges from, it can range to anyone, but it's very common in people who have intellectual disabilities. And uh, you mentioned three steps. What are the three steps? One of them involves reward. Okay, so for ABA, the three steps are blocking, redirecting, and rewarding. Thank you. You're Now, now um, Kelsey, um, it, would it be fair to say in the, the context of this presentation with autism that um, PICA is typically more prevalent in, in the um, younger people, like kids? Yes, it's definitely more common in kids, and the prevalence of PICA decreases as your age increases. Okay. I, I had a cousin who used to eat limestone, but I don't think he still does. Okay. <laughs> yeah, the objects definitely range. It's that's why it's hard to treat too, because it's so different for everyone. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, with the with the adults, um, you said that brief restraint is better than having uh, longer periods of restraint. Would you say that's true for both children and adults, or were you talking primarily for children? Uh, I think it's true for both children and adults. The study that I read um, mainly dealt with young people, but it it was a range. It wasn't just um, very young children. Uh, I think this was because if the restraint lasts for too long, the child or the individual won't really understand that it's the immediate um, kind of punishment for their behavior because it takes too long of a span. It needs to be brief and. A, it needs to be directly after a peak of behavior. Thank you. Kelsey, you, you have here the tips for parents to seek yeah. out resources. What were those resources again you, you mentioned? Um, so the main source of resource I would say would be the board certified behavior analyst or a BCBA. Um, this is just a trained professional in PICA and they can then refer you or figure out what the best treatment plan would be for you or any individual with PICA. Okay. Kelsey, has there been any studies or any observations um, with children like you're trying to replace the non-food items? Let's say um, the crushed up Oreos or the powdered sugar where they rejected it because they can tell, are they able to differentiate? 
I haven't read any research that specifically regards the effects of doing this. I've just read that it can be effective, but just like I've mentioned for other treatments, it's definitely going to be um, specific for every individual. So it might work great for one person. It might not work at all. You might have to try to find a different treatment plan for someone else. It just, it really varies from individual to individual. Mm. Okay. For some autistic kids, is it more like they want the satisfaction of being able to chew on something or is it specifically like they like a taste and, and a feel of something? I think it's a combination of both. Um, it mainly has to do with sensory stimulation. So they enjoy the feeling of it in their mouth. Um, but it could also just be that they enjoy just chewing it in general too, but it's, it's mainly the sensory um, feedback that they're getting from the object. Do the, does this behavior in children um, transfer into some other compulsive behavior when they become an adult, maybe a different eating disorder or some other type of disorder? Um, I know that well, I mentioned for treatment for the medicine, a lot of it, um, a lot of the medications contain um, compulsive behavior properties. So I think it does have a lot to do with if you do exhibit peak of behaviors, you're likely to exhibit other compulsive behaviors or obsessive compulsive behaviors. I am not familiar with PICA turning into any other eating disorder though. Any other questions? I don't think there are any more questions. Okay. Yeah, I think we're good. Okay. Well, thank you so much for listening to my presentation. I really hope it was helpful. Um, if you do have any other questions, like I said before, you can video record them in the support group, the autism support group, and someone will get back to you. Okay, bye. <laughs>